General Motors just released the details of the new 2025 C8 ZR1. Visually, it's almost the same as the standard C8 or the Z06 with a few exterior pieces to make it stand out, like the hood and a few aero bits and the split rear window showcasing that LT7 engine, which apparently makes over a thousand horsepower. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna to be talking about the differences between the LT2, LT6, and the LT7 that's gonna be in the new upcoming ZR1. And how Chevy managed to squeeze over a thousand horsepower out of this 5.5 liter V8. Damn, let's get into it. All right, let me take you back a little bit. It's the early 50s and the European sports cars are leaving America behind. Europe, 1950. New sights and new sounds flash across the continent as road racing erupts into a truly international sport. So General Motors decides that, you know what? I'm gonna try to get involved. So in 1953, they came out with one of their own sports car. Introducing America's only true sports car. It was a nice looking roadster with a 3.9 liter inline six that made a whopping 150 horsepower. Zero to 60, 11.2 seconds. Yeah, so to give you an idea how slow that is, come closer. The Dodge Caravan, this guy, does a zero to 60 in 7.8 seconds. Oh, that was fast at the time. 1953 Jaguar C-Type. Zero to 60, eight seconds. That's right, moving on. Shortly after the Corvette was launched, GM hired a Belgian engineer named Zora Arkis Duntov. Honestly, I'm not sure if that's how his mom would have pronounced it, but I'm doing my best here. This guy knew what he was doing. First thing he did, he went up to the executives and said, listen boys, people want performance. This inline six, it's not gonna do. Let's give this car a V8. And they said, Fine. So in 1955, the Corvette was offered with a 265 cubic inch V8 as an option. The V8 was obviously way better. The zero to 60 time was three whole seconds faster. And the consumers liked it too. GM only sold an estimated six Corvettes with the inline six that year. After that, Zora became Chevy's high performance director and he kept pushing the performance of the Corvette. He also pushed for a mid-engine Corvette but it was turned down every single time. Zora believed if GM wanted to compete with the European sports cars, they had to make the Corvette mid-engine. But the executives just didn't agree. Eight Corvette generations and many mid-engine prototypes later, GM finally decided to make a mid-engine Corvette for the 2020 model year. It came with a naturally aspirated V8, the LT2, which is a less-based pushrod engine that makes 495 horsepower and 470 pound-feet of torque. But that's not what we're focusing on today. You see, Chevy was playing around with something real nice at the same time. developing and testing it with the C8R race car at the track. And that Corvette was not running the 6.2 liter pushrod V8. It was using a naturally aspirated 5.5 liter V8 with dual overhead cam, flat plane crank, high revving monster called the Gemini engine. This engine is a clean sheet design. It shares almost nothing with the LS based engines and the V8 and the Cadillac Blackwing. And since the racing division and the production team co-developed this engine, a lot of the parts and technology from the engine and the race car was actually carried over to the production engine. Things like lightweight forged titanium connecting rods, forged aluminum pistons, full racing style dry sump oiling system with individual crank bay scavenging, dual coil valve springs, titanium intake and sodium filled exhaust valves. The Gemini is literally what you get when executives at a car company 
Tell the engineers to just send it. They developed two variants of this engine. The LT6, which ended up in the new Z06. It revs all the way up to 8,600 RPM, making 670 horsepower and 460 pound-feet of torque. More powerful than the Mercedes SLS AMG Black Series V8, the M159, making it the most powerful naturally aspirated production V8. The other variant of the Gemini engine is the LT7, which powers the new ZR1. Listen, there are three things that would help a combustion engine make dumb amounts of power. One is high RPMs. Two is big displacement. Three is forced induction. Usually engineers pick one or at most two of these to get the power they want, which is the case with the LT6, a high revving 5.5 liter V8. But for the LT7, they went for all three. The LT7 is twin turbocharged, so forced induction, 5.5 liter V8, big displacement, and it revs all the way up to 8,000 RPM, making 1,064 horsepower with 848 pound-feet of torque. The most powerful V8 in an American production car ever. But how did they manage to squeeze over 1,000 horsepower out of the LT7 when his twin brother, the LT6, makes 670. They couldn't just slap on a pair of turbos and make 1,000 horsepower, it's not that easy. I made a video about building an engine for boost where I actually explained some of the stuff that I'm about to go over right now. But to sum it all up, for any boosted application, you want to manage heat and cylinder pressures because too much heat would make things melt or cause knock or detonation. And too much cylinder pressure would also cause knock and detonation, especially with conventional pump gas. So where the LT6 used lightweight components and optimized airflow to get power out of a high revving engine, the LT7 was made to tolerate an insane amount of heat and cylinder pressures by beefing up some components, reducing the compression ratio, and pulling back on the RPMs. To manage the extra heat and cylinder pressures, they went with dished pistons. They also used shorter and beefier connecting rods and thicker wrist pins to handle the extreme forces. The crank was also machined differently to accommodate the new pistons and rods. Moving on to the cylinder heads, they were CNC machined to give them a larger combustion chamber to lower compression ratio. They gave it a different cam timing and lift profile to get the most out of the forced induction. They also used exhaust valves that can handle higher exhaust temperatures. With the dish pistons, shorter rods, and a bigger or deeper combustion chamber, they managed to reduce the compression ratio from 12.5 in the LT6 to 9.8 in the twin turbo LT7, making it easy to turn off the boost without the potential risk of knock even on pump gas. The turbos are ported shroud ball bearing monoscroll 76 millimeter turbochargers. The turbine housing is integrated into the exhaust manifold to get the best turbo response and minimum lag. And the boost is controlled with an electronic wastegate, which could potentially mean way more boost just with a tune. These turbos produce 25 PSI of boost. The charged air from the turbos go through a water to air intercooler to keep the air dense and cool. And unlike the LT6 that has only direct injection, the LT7 has both port and direct injection to get the fuel it needs to make that 1064 horsepower. This twin turbocharge package is very responsive. Because of how close everything is together, you shouldn't feel any lag at all. The turbine housing is literally part of the exhaust manifold. And even then, the engineers gave the ZR1 an anti-lag tune to keep the turbo spooling when you let off the throttle. Overall, I think this engine deserves all the hype that it gets and more. Especially in an era where most high performance cars are going hybrid electric. It uses some exotic and high dollar components that you usually only see in race cars or hyper cars. What an incredible machine and I cannot wait to see or hear it in person. And you never know, if you like, share or subscribe, Chevy might let your boy take it out for a spin one day. So do what you gotta do, like it costs you nothing. And one more thing. Apparently, they're not limiting production numbers. So if you want one and have the money, you can just walk into a dealership and buy one. You can't do that with a GT3 RS, can you? Maybe it's finally time that Europeans learned a few things from Americans.